The Ethereum community has been in active discussion to bring a decent distribution of clients across the network. If you are interested in checking out another CL option to run a client node or a validator node, continue watching. Welcome to Pee Penny episode 88. I'm your host Pooja Ranjan. And in this special episode on Know Your Client, we are joined by a very special guest, Solius Grigaitis, to provide an overview of Grandine, a consensus layer client. Welcome to the show, Solius. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, so, so, yes, I'm Solius Grigaitis, and I'm going to talk a bit today about uh, Grandina client um, that we are building. It's really been a while since I'm trying to have you on the show. So, I'm looking forward to learning about Grandine. But before that, maybe please have a little bit about you, your professional background, and the journey with Ethereum. Yeah, so uh, um, I have kind of mixed uh, the experience of uh, in the industry. Uh, I'm, I would say I'm half uh, uh, industry engineer and half uh, acad- academic person. Um, uh, apart from like my main uh, work where uh, uh, we build the uh, uh, large scale uh, systems. Uh, apart from that, I've been parallel. I'm working at the university. I'm associate professor at the Vilnius uh, University uh, Mathematics and Informatics Faculty. So uh, I would say the background is, is really diverse uh, from uh, real world uh, uh, applications and uh, various real world problems to, to academic uh, uh, research. And uh, yeah, with, uh, with the cryptocurrencies and Ethereum and, and the Bitcoin, I think I, I don't remember actually the exact day but when we uh, when we got like very interested but actually remember the very first uh, time when I got uh, this um, a Bitcoin paper and I even tried to uh, to run a Bitcoin client uh, but it didn't seem for some reason <laughs> so so uh, yeah and uh, after that I think I, I didn't uh, came back to to this but it was like many years ago at the, at the beginning of the, of the Bitcoin and uh, yeah and uh, we came back to this uh, cryptocurrency thing I think during the the, the next uh, big hype when we uh minor the theorem and some other uh, coins so yeah uh, so yeah i would say i got some uh, some touch uh, with uh, with the technology from the very very early days uh, but yeah uh, we seriously started to uh, to look at it uh, like in 2000 18 i think or, or something like that and and before then it was just more uh, funny things like mining and so on uh, you know just uh, just uh, following the, uh, the hype and, and technology so so yeah that's uh, that's a short uh, uh, background by myself uh, also for, apart from uh, from the uh, from the like distributed systems and theory and so on I'm also interested in cryptography, and this is, I think, one of the unique uh, combinations that you have among uh, client developers. As uh, you, the cryptography is a bit, uh, uh, well, the to- this topic is is not um, very, let's say, very deeply interested for every engineer. So some some of them are interested, but uh, but most of them not. So so that's an interesting uh, uh, thing. And yeah, the I'm part uh, that I'm running. Uh, we have just a, a bit more uh, than five core uh, developers. That uh, some of them are uh, devs, and some of them are uh, more academic uh, background uh, with uh, with focus on the research. And uh, yeah, the key uh, focus for the team is, uh, of course, the high performance um, distributed systems. And before, uh, before uh, doing uh, or entering the blockchain space, we were more on these uh, regular web TO systems, uh, which were not uh, fault tolerant, of course, but uh, but also uh, like a high performance. And, uh, and uh, they were similar. 
uh, challenges like we have uh, today with the blockchain systems, but in, of course in a different uh, setup and uh, in a different angle. And yeah, as I mentioned, uh, the cryptography is another thing uh, which we're interested both uh, from the theoretical and from the engineering perspective. And uh, apart from the core team, uh, as I'm working at, uh, at the university, I have a blockchain um, technologies course. Uh, we have students that uh, that are also interested in these um, uh, technologies and uh, some of the projects like this KTG library is, um, is something that um, I'm running with uh, uh, with uh, students at my course and uh, yeah, the entire team is located in Lithuania, uh, so this is the country in, uh, in Europe, north uh, or uh, northeast Europe, and yeah, you can check on the map, this is not very big country, but uh, uh, <laughs> uh, let's, um, let's hope it, it will be noticed in this blockchain community. So that's a short uh, description of uh, the team. So the client, um, the Grandin client that uh, uh, we are building on, uh, we started that in 2019. Uh, yeah, the, the key focus, um, which I think evolved during uh, uh, during the building, uh, it is uh, is actually focus on uh, optimization and uh, parallelization. And uh, this is um, uh, one of the uh, six uh, main clients used in uh, production. And uh, well, maybe there are even more clients, uh, but I don't know. Uh, at least I'm I'm not uh, aware of. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And uh, for the um, based on the information we have from the client from the users, um, uh, they are running both uh, uh, staking and non-staking nodes uh, depending on their uh, need. Uh, the uh, let's say the, the share or percentage of course is is not a uh, high but uh, but it is actually used in the uh, on the main uh, mainnet uh, for production uh, applications and uh, yeah it's a pretty i would say pretty complete uh, client in terms of uh, the features uh, we have uh, full beacon of the api which means that you can attach a lot of things uh, to this so uh, everyone knows that uh, client diversity is a really important uh, thing. And this is uh, the chat from uh, the uh, Megalops guys. Uh, they, they did the uh, uh, they developed a crawler that uh, scans the network for and uh, asks uh, and check, checks for the client uh, uh, version. So, so it's not, uh, I would say, really not uh, very reliable uh, data, uh, but it gives some uh, understanding on the uh, on the uh, you know on the shares of uh, of the clients and. The, uh, at least based on this information, we see that uh, there is uh, there are some clients in the network that uh, uh, that are using um, uh, some users that are using the Grandian client, and uh, and there are some other clients, of course, with uh, with a few really large like Lighthouse and uh, uh, Prism. So let's go to this uh, interesting uh, part, uh, which is. Um, uh, the like performance and the other uh, other uh, criteria. So uh, for the state transition uh, function, um, I don't know. Maybe other clients now are much faster, but at least um, uh, when the Mega Labs guys uh, uh, did the uh, the benchmarks, the, I think it was something like half a year ago, something uh, like that. Uh, so. On the uh, fat instance, uh, which has a lot of cores, so Grandina was performing like uh, around roughly around three times uh, uh, faster than uh, than any uh, other fastest client. So you can see like uh, uh, roughly on the hour eight. Uh, uh, Grandina was already on the slot two thousand, uh, sorry two uh, two million. And uh, other fastest clients reach it uh, with this uh, point at roughly um, 24 hours. So, so in terms of uh, the syncing speed uh, or uh, state transition uh, speed, which is uh, correlates basically correlates to to the syncing speed. Uh, so, Grandina is like um, 
roughly three times uh, faster on, on this particular machine actually on our machine we get a, on our machines we get even uh, higher results so uh, as long as you have a uh, modern cpu with uh, lots of uh, cores uh, uh, then you will get a really uh, outstanding results in terms of state transition performance uh, if you're using uh, Grenin. So the CPU usage, so this chart is uh, for the CPU usage for the uh, period when the client is syncing. And uh, you can see that uh, Grenin is using a much more uh, CPU. And uh, well, the reason is that it's, it's a much more paralyzed than uh, other clients. And this is uh, part of the speed um, uh, that uh, that you get. Uh, uh, basically, uh, the, the reason uh, why you get uh, really good performance with uh, Grandina is that uh, it's uh, the algorithms there are are par paralyzed a lot. So it means as long as you have a lot of cores, uh, you get a, a better speed. So this is uh, roughly speaking. And uh, for the memory usage, this is the chart uh, uh, from the from the same Megalab uh, guys, uh, uh, and this particular chart is for the uh, memory uh, when Grandini was syncing on the Raspberry Pi uh, device. And the good thing uh, for the Raspberry is uh, that it, it's kind of a resource constrained uh, device, and uh, and it's very visible. Uh, uh, you know, if if you have uh, some process that uh, uh, that doesn't use a lot of uh, memory, then you can you can run that on on some restricted on such restricted uh, devices like Raspberry Pi, and you can see that uh, memory usage is similar to to the other client uh, Nimbus, which is uh, uh, kind of targeting uh, these uh, low resources uh, devices. So this is another feature um, uh, that we have uh, this uh, low memory uh, usage. And the disk usage, uh, this is for um, the disk, uh, use disk space uh, uh, for uh, uh, different clients, uh, basically during the syncing uh, time. And uh, I'm not sure that, uh, this is um, uh, this is let's say very informative uh, chart uh, because it it depends uh, you know what uh, what kind of uh, uh, or like what is the way the the client is storing uh, uh, the uh, information on the disk and the and for Grandinas it's uh, in memory. Uh, basically in memory uh, client uh, we just dump. Uh, uh, some um, some data periodically, like uh, uh, during the syncing, uh, like uh, we, we store uh, blocks that we download and store some inner states, uh, uh, like every every n epochs, like by default, I think it's like thirty two or something like that. So uh, in terms of uh, the storage. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, as, as, as we focus on in-memory performance, uh, we don't have something, uh, um, some, some, some big, uh, uh, some magic uh, uh, with the disk usage, simply uh, just dump things there and, uh, and take it when, when we need. So, yeah, and then uh, we have this, um, uh, this, these slides on, on the um, architecture and, uh, these are the key points that, uh, or the key ideas that we build, uh, uh, that we usually focus when when we build or design some new features. So the simplicity is the key thing. Uh, we try to. What we found is that if we make a, a simple solution for for uh, <laughs> for hard problem, uh, then most of the time it it works pretty well and uh, and then we come back uh, uh, if if it actually doesn't work or if uh, if you find that uh, there is a better decision later and uh, yeah this again as, as i mentioned um, the client is actually optimized for running in memory and uh, this was the key thing as we we just uh, um, uh, thought that uh, well if you want to have a really great performance uh, then the best is to run it uh, uh, try to focus uh, to fit everything into uh, memory and as we saw 
Now, if we optimize it, uh, uh, not only the performance, but also the memory usage. So for this approach, you not only get a, a great performance, but you also get a, a low memory usage, which is an interesting uh, outcome. Uh, because, you know, if, if you think that something needs to be uh, to run in memory, you just, uh, you may think that uh, it will take uh, a lot of memory to run it. So, yeah, there is another uh, design aspect uh, that is heavily uh, used used in Grandini's uh, structural sharing. It's basically uh, whenever there is a repetition of the data uh, in the memory, uh, we try to not uh, copy it and instead just uh, uh, use a one instance of that uh, uh, data and have references uh, to that uh, instance of data. And uh, yeah, the caching, uh, actually, the, uh, the caching strategies that we use, it leverages this um, uh, structural sharing uh, concept. So, so we don't have much of caches where we just uh, copy the entire thing and store it uh, uh, for uh, some time. Uh, you know, it's much more like even if we need to, to store some, something, uh, this is uh, not a copy. Usually, this is just a references to to something that is already on the memory, and uh, yeah, for the state transition function, we micro optimized it uh, a lot, and that's why it's uh, much faster than uh, than other uh, clients. And uh, yeah, another aspect is of course uh, the have uh, it's it's a heavily parallelized uh, um, client and. The more cores on the CPU that you have, basically, the more the, the faster is uh, uh, the client, the uh, uh, the Grandin client, and uh, yeah, the features uh, for the client is of course the core, and the biggest part is uh, uh, optimized Beacon node. This is like the main thing, and uh, uh, and uh, we also have, uh, of course, the uh, Beacon Node API, uh, which enables to to connect uh, uh, all the other components that uh, uh, that consumes uh, uh, Beacon Node API. And uh, the validator currently is uh, built in into uh, into the same binary. I think we, this is something that uh, that we should extract um, pretty soon. Uh, because uh, well, the validator client actually is pretty light uh, itself. It just signs uh, uh, things, and uh, this probably will not be hard to uh, extract. And then, of course, the regular stuff such as um, slashing protection, which uh, everyone should run, never disable, and uh, <laughs> no matter what, uh, you need the slashing protection. And uh, of course, we have it, uh, and it supports this. Uh, uh, standard uh, uh, slashing protection format, uh, so we can import from the other clients and that so export from the uh, Grandina uh, to to other client uh, uh, when you're doing switches between uh, the clients, and um, uh, this is uh, there is a, a web signer, uh, web three signer uh, support, uh, which allows you to uh, you know if if you want to use built-in validator uh, then. Uh, well, the only way uh, we have now is uh, you put your keys in a web signer, web signer, and then uh, you can securely protect your keys uh, from the binary. And uh, yeah, we also have a few other components, which is GUI, uh, graphic user interface, and slasher, which we don't use that much now, and uh, we don't maintain that much really. <laughs> I don't know even. Uh, does it uh, still work uh, well? Uh, because you know, for graphic user user interface, for us it was very interesting at the beginning when uh, when we uh, needed to analyze um, uh, like block rewards or attestation rewards or something like that, and this visualization helped a lot. And for the slasher, um, you know, as long as there is at least one altruistic uh, slasher in the network, which uh, uh, which is monitoring uh, bad behavior, and then uh, if if it finds it, it just uh, distributes uh, uh, the messages so others can include them uh, uh, in their uh, activities. Then you are uh, safe. So <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, people are so obsessed about the slashers uh, these days. <laughs> they, probably everyone thinks that somebody runs it and, <laughs> and we are safe. <laughs> so yeah. Um, that's of the core features, and then uh, the the language that uh, Grandin has written is Rust, and um, 
we actually when we started like a few years ago we were debating what, what should we uh, choose and uh, we were thinking about actually Golang and uh, and the rest between those uh, two languages and we are very happy that at that point uh, uh, we decided to go with rust uh, even though at at that time the rust is was still pretty bleeding uh, edge technology you know, like you know like three four years uh, ago and uh, but it's completely different uh, today uh, you know this is uh, like i would say top language probably for such type of applications and yeah the reasons main reasons are that uh, performance uh, really high performance uh, comparable to c++ and uh, even though the performance is uh, is really great uh, the language has um, high level uh, features and so it's uh, once you uh, once you get familiar with rust it's 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 really low language and uh, a lot of people are um, preferring especially you can see now in in cryptography space like almost everyone is uh, is building stuff with uh, with rust uh, so that's uh, that's really great and another feature which is uh, in my opinion, is super important as the Rust doesn't have garbage collector. So, so there is no such things as uh, stop the world and uh, let's uh, collect some garbage and uh, who knows how long it will take or how much uh, memory we will free uh, during this uh, cycle. And uh, yeah, I think this is one of the core uh, like attributes or, or benefits comparing to the other languages. And they, uh, then we have memory safety thing, which helps a lot with um, uh, basically with, with proper allocation and the allocation of memory. It doesn't solve all the issues of uh, memory uh, usage, but it's a really great, really fantastic thing to have built in, in uh, the, this uh, borrow checker and, uh, and other mechanisms that are, that are in the language. And of course, the key thing for us is the concurrency uh, they call it fearless concurrency i would say sometimes uh, it's not so fearless but but uh, it helps a lot actually the compiler helps a lot with the uh, uh, with uh, with um, proper concurrency and then of course uh, uh, cross-platform aspect which is pretty important uh, uh, these days as everyone expects that software runs everywhere and the uh, entire rest ecosystem is pretty good with the uh, cross-platform uh, thing and yeah we have uh, another kind of preference or uh, or approach that we use is uh, we try to use uh, libraries uh, that are uh, available uh, so this is kind of the longer term uh, benefit or or uh, hope that uh, this will help uh, to bring people like after the client is open sourced and people uh, may get uh, uh, more familiar with the code base uh, because we try to use uh, uh, some popular uh, libraries so here are some some list um, uh, of the things that uh, uh, we use uh yeah there is a uh, overlap because as we use um, uh, this um, uh, library that was uh, developed by lighthouse uh, uh, before this it's a little p2p and also which is based on the rust p2p uh, library so there is a, some overlap uh, uh, with uh, with light, lighthouse at the network level but uh, network stack and uh, but otherwise uh, Oh, there is also on on the cryptography BLST, uh, like it's used for all the clients uh, currently. I think uh, um, for the elliptical cryptography and uh, and uh, a lot of other things are well either the standard like Rayon or Tokyo, which everyone uses, either either something uh, different like I think Lighthouse maybe doesn't use a Web three uh, library, so. Uh, yeah, whenever we can use some library, we try uh, to do that. Uh, so uh, this is one of the approaches uh, we use. And uh, yeah, another really interesting thing is how we get um, uh, compliant with the specification and uh, uh, with uh, and, uh, other uh, clients. So uh, some of the key things and the things that we use is, uh, of course, we, we use the Ethereum Foundation uh, test vectors. Uh, they have a really high um library of uh, of test vectors uh, uh, that are pretty low level uh, <coughs> so i would say 
um, unit test, uh, often unit test level, which helps a lot with um, with the base uh, uh, or core functionality like state transition functions and so on. And um, we also use Hive uh, test uh, tests that um, uh, that uh, uh, currently are uh, written for um, for I think maybe other five clients, uh, but we use that code base and run uh, Hive tests against uh, uh, Grandina. And then what we found really interesting is that if we integrate um, other uh, other uh, available uh, services or, or software, uh, for example, like a vouch, uh, which consumes uh, Beacon Node API heavily, this helps a lot, uh, uh, you know, to find the small differences and um, and so on. So, so the integration with uh, with uh, other stuff that is already available uh, helps a lot with uh, with both finding uh, small details and and even some some bigger uh, incompatibilities. And yeah, and the last thing which is also very helpful, we have. Uh, around 5,000 of uh, Gordley validators uh, that we are running. And uh, we try to run with the different uh, setups like uh, as part of, um, of the uh, validators um, that we run are, um, are signing with uh, a Web3 signer, part uh, are running by Vouch and part are uh, key, part of the keys are uh, passed to the, uh, to the Beacon uh, node client itself. With a built-in validator and uh, monitoring the performance of these clients uh, helps a lot really to also understand that uh, maybe there is some change uh, uh, that we don't have uh, and, and that's why our validators are performing not so well uh, so i would say these are the key things uh, um, that that we that helps us a lot uh, to make a, a, a compliant uh, client and <coughs> Sorry, yes, as, as I mentioned, uh, because we have a, a standard Beacon Node API, uh, you can always use um, uh, just uh, uh, basically not, not use the built in validator and use the uh, Beacon Node, uh, the Grandina Beacon Node with uh, API, and uh, just connect all the uh, other stuff uh, uh, to the to our beacon node and, uh, and it just uh, works uh, if it doesn't work let me know uh, <laughs> there may be some uh, incompatible incompatible issue so yeah as, as you see you can connect various um, well, data clients um, and uh, you can connect vouch and web signer and also uh, if you are if you want to boost your uh, profit then uh, then connect the uh, mev booster so um, so yeah this is pretty i would say pretty compatible and pretty standard uh, uh, client uh, in terms of uh, uh, of you know comparison to the uh, to the features or or compatibility uh, with the other clients that uh, that are uh, in the ecosystem yeah and the target users um, uh, we believe that um, because of the performance uh, and, uh, uh, and the lightness of, uh, of the client. So uh, the staking pools, pools are um, targeting, are, are our target because, uh, you know, they are running a lot of uh, clients per, uh, a lot of validators per machine. Uh, and, uh, you know, they are not so solo stakers <laughs> where they put uh, one validator per uh, pure machine. So for this, you need uh, pretty good performance, uh, and this is, uh, of course, uh, faster clients are are better for this uh, use case. And also for um, home stakers uh, that, for instance, are staking on Raspberry Pi or or some other uh, really um, resource restrictive uh, hardware, uh, this is really great uh, to have a light client and um, light client. I mean lightweight client uh, so full client that is just uh, not uh, uh, doesn't consume a lot of resources and uh, yeah once it's open sourced uh, uh, people that are preferring rust uh, this is also our target uh, uh, audience uh, as we see like lighthouse has a really great uh, really large market share and it looks like people are not uh, uh, afraid of Rust, they are happy with uh, uh, with the clients that uh, are written uh, in Rust, 
And uh, yeah, this is, I would say, if it wasn't advantage uh, like four years ago, it's probably now an advantage really you know, to have a client, everything and the rest. And yeah, basically everyone else um, who is looking for high performance and uh, lightweight client. Yeah, so th this is pretty much the target uh, users that we uh, think about. And yeah, the image, uh, I really like this uh, uh, image that, that was so uh, shared on the network uh, uh, during the, on the social uh, media and, and uh, uh, elsewhere. And um, yeah, for the image, uh, I don't think, uh, uh, surprisingly, yeah, surprisingly it went extremely smooth. Uh, it's probably because there were a lot of testing uh, and uh, the risks that um, everyone were afraid of were not um, actually um, that real. Uh, so, uh, so this is probably one of the reasons why we have we had a, a so great uh, uh, transition to proof of stake. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, for the preparation and the, and after the uh, the match, we mainly test with uh, Geth. Uh, well, the reason is that uh, the consensus seems that is once, uh, if you have a client that uh, talks well with Geth, uh, it most likely will talk well with other uh, clients. Uh, and the uh, developers doesn't like to test uh, a lot, uh, you know, with the different combinations and so on. So, so far we, we are using Geth, but uh, I don't know, maybe we'll change it uh, for, for our internal uh, testing and as as we have high tests, I think um, uh, we'll need uh, we'll just need to to run a different um, uh, combinations with different clients, uh, uh, execution layer, layer clients. As this is uh, pretty easy with high, uh, as there is no this uh, manual work which uh, no of the developers are <laughs> happy with, and. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, as far as we know, some other users are actually preferring uh, different clients and we are happy that they are testing. But I think so far, I don't know, maybe, probably no one even reported the, the problem that uh, Grandina works with Geth and doesn't work with something else. Uh, but yeah, let's see. Uh, but we know that uh, other users are, are testing uh, and preferring some other uh, clients. Which is natural, you know. If you if you take some niche CL client, then most likely you will not uh, go with uh, Geth and will will, will take something um, interesting from the execution layer uh, side. Yes. Yeah, so another hot topic. Uh, this is um, EIP four eight four four, which everyone is so focused uh, uh, recently after uh, the merge. And uh, yeah, our contribution is uh, is pretty interesting there as we have uh, this KCG library that um, that we are developing um, uh, a lot with, uh, with uh, my students. And yeah, we started, I think, like a year or, or more ago. And uh, you know, at that time, the spec was uh, com was not completely, but but pretty different. Uh, however, it still used the KZG um, scheme. So we implemented the KZG uh, scheme uh, back then. And the interesting thing of this library is that uh, uh, it allows to switch between uh, uh, different elliptic cryptography backend libraries. So we have like uh, four supported, which is uh, Arcworks, PLST, uh, MCL, and uh, ZK Crypto. So uh, this is something um, really interesting as um, with the library that we are building, we are able to measure uh, the performance differences between uh, different elliptic cryptography libraries and uh, and these differences are pretty significant uh, so and uh, the library also have some parallelization which you can run in parallelized or non parallelized mode and this is also uh, shows uh, uh, pretty good uh, results in terms uh, that the, the, there could be a really good uh, speed up if uh, proper parallelization is uh, in place so so this is all open source and um, uh, feel free to to go to the link uh, uh, in the slide um yeah this is uh, some uh, some slide that uh, that i i needed to think a bit uh, uh, to to remember some interesting parts uh, uh, because um, you 
often or like every week uh, find uh, uh, something new and something interesting and something that surprises you but uh, because everything is moving so fast you get uh, uh, your memory raised uh, so fast and it's very hard to, to to remember something which surprised you a lot uh, like a year ago and uh, just a few things like um, uh, we were i think we were the first implementation which back then um, like a couple of years ago or so uh, had original optimized uh, for choice uh, implementation um, all other clients were using uh, the uh, port uh, uh, to their language of the protari uh, library and uh, because we had our unique uh, implementation not the uh, basically not not the translation to uh, from from the uh, protari uh, golang to to our own language like to Rust, uh, we found an uh, interesting uh, uh, exploit, uh, which was uh, reported via uh, bug bounty uh, program. And uh, yeah, this this was uh, something that, that I remember pretty good. Another thing, uh, uh, like a group of, um, of things that, uh, that we often face is that Asgranin is really extremely paralyzed and we try to paralyze as much as possible. And uh, it turns out that if you do that too much, um, you know, the, the good thing, of course, that if you're running on, on CPU with LF, of course, then you get much better performance. However, it comes with, uh, with some cost. Uh, so, for example, uh, what we found that uh, it is a bit tricky to mix uh, the Tokyo and Rayon uh, libraries uh, together uh, because it, it often leads to uh, to some runtime errors. Uh, this, this is something that compiler cannot check uh, during the compilation uh, phase. And yeah, this is uh, sometimes leads to some issues which you uh, figure out only by running the client, which is not preferred way, especially for uh, for languages that uh, like Rust, uh, where you try to eliminate as much as as much as possible of technical problems uh, at compilation time. Yeah, and another thing that uh, you like, you cannot just uh, careless. Uh, uh, spin uh, threads or parallelize whatever you want, whenever you want, uh, uh, because the priorities uh, are important uh, and uh, you know there are some more important uh, uh, things that need to be executed uh, sooner than some others. So, so this also matters. And uh, we with parallelization we went with uh, really crazy and extreme ideas. For example. Uh, we spent a few months or wasted a few months uh, of um, time by trying to make uh, a hard forks uh, uh, running in separate runtimes. So this was something um, uh, at that time it, it was pretty interesting idea for us, but then we figured out that uh, in this case, you actually have the complexity of, uh, of the merge uh, whenever you have a, a regular hard fork, uh, because if you have hard forks running in in a separate uh, uh, runtimes, it's it's more or less something uh, similar uh, like the merge we had, and this is something uh, not uh, uh, something not good. It's much better to to have a regular uh, hard forking where we have a single runtime which just switches at the hard fork. So yeah, I, I would say a lot of uh, findings or a lot of uh, uh, experiments that uh, both uh, failed and both uh, you know, some of them uh, led to really great results like the uh, high performance of the client we have is related to parallelization. Yeah, and the roadmap. Uh, so what we are going to do next, uh, we're trying to, to solve this um, uh, funding uh, station that we have uh, now. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I'll talk, I'll have a separate, uh, separate uh, slide about that. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, the protodunk sharding or um, EIP 4844, and uh, some other upcoming things like withdrawals and, and uh, so uh, is something that we are going to build next. And uh, the KZG library that I mentioned uh, before, uh, so, so it is updated uh, currently to the latest um, um, the EIP 4844 uh, specification. So this needs some, some extra work. Uh, 
and yeah our early adopters uh, are requesting uh, some features and uh, yeah, i would say the feature developments apart from the upcoming uh, uh, hard forks this is mostly based on what we hear from our users uh, and actually like the beacon node, node api we implemented it it was a big feature but only because people said uh, okay we like we would like to run with uh, open source what later clients or bitwatch and and so on and how can we do that and we said okay you cannot do that because at that time we didn't have the api uh, and yeah uh, i think api opens um, a lot of uh, you know a lot of use cases uh, because there are so much components we, which you can attach to the beacon of the api and that's uh, that's how you know how how uh, this ecosystem is organized and yeah the uh, this relates of course with, uh, with what uh, i said uh, i mean the, the, the integrations with ecosystem components and of course the optimizations is something that we do uh in uh, like always uh, you know like uh, this is kind of um, we are doing parallelization in parallel <laughs> to, to the features that we develop um, uh, yeah and another thing that that we also really interesting um, and we spending uh, like some uh, some significant time is uh, is uh, those generalized um, uh, proving systems like uh, plonk uh, and uh, of course, um, uh, the latest uh, uh, trends in the scaling the solutions, especially ZK rollups, um, uh, especially those that are are more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, built or um, or these concepts uh, uh, based on on this uh, on these generalized schemes like uh, uh, Plong. So this is something that I think maybe even could. Uh, help to to open source uh, grandina if, if we can build a uh, let's say a zk rollup uh, which uh, uh, which you know generates revenue or, or something like that and or in some other way uh, solves the uh, the funding uh, thing we have then yeah it could be an interesting uh, uh, an interesting branch and uh, yeah for the community uh, we we actually not uh, pushing uh, uh, forward much, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, of artificially trying to grow the uh, usage. So there are some people that um, uh, that are interested and they are using uh, the client and we're getting feedback from them and uh, that's the main uh, like main driver for uh, the features uh, apart from from the planned uh, network upgrades and uh, yeah. Uh, I would say the community is is not uh, big, but uh, they are using uh, this um, the Beacon Node API in, in really interesting ways, and that helps to find uh, a little uh, details uh, that we need to uh, fix. And the yeah, app, if you want to reach us, then just uh, uh, join us uh, on the Discord. That's the best uh, uh, place. Yeah, and. Uh, that's probably the last slide I have. Uh, so, so yes, so so when uh, open source, uh, this is something that we get uh, uh, pretty often. And uh, yeah, the the reason is the key reason is the uh, the funding really, and uh, we used uh, basically we didn't have access to this um, uh, public goods funding, which is uh, I would say uh, not that widely available. And instead, we use the uh, more standard or more, you know, common uh, commercial uh, or, or commercial products oriented product, which uh, came with some uh, obligations, and we, and we need to find a way to uh, to solve that. And yeah, I don't know as uh, as the original way was, uh, uh, we just keep building stuff and and keep building some some new products, and hopefully this. Uh, uh, this solves uh, the funding problem uh, one day, but uh, we were very like optimistic at the beginning. But we see that things are taking a lot of time. Uh, you know, uh, everything is taking more time than you expect uh, initially. So we will try. I think we will try some round of, uh, uh, you know, try to reach again some ecosystem organizations. Uh, ecosystem support organizations and hopefully uh, maybe they will have ideas uh, how to solve the funding um, thing we have so yeah that's pretty much uh, all i had prepared uh, for today 
and Pooja, if you have or anybody else who is on the call, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Nice talk, nice presentation. Thank you. Really, it was quite thorough. You very well covered the performance metrics, the features, language, and uh, the roadmap. I'm sure users will find it interesting and have another consensus layer client node running option. As I mentioned that you have presented a very thorough, so you almost have covered all the questions that I had, but okay. I would still like to take a couple of more with you. My first question is about uh, features and performance metrics. So you did talk about uh, different features, slashing protection, remote signer, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was this mention of slasher. I know you very well mentioned that when the network is good enough. I just wonder if Grandin is running any slasher on its own. No, we, <laughs> frankly speaking. Um, th this is probably, uh, together with the graphic user interface, uh, this is probably the least loved uh, component we have. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I think we are uh, we are in terms in terms of uh, you know like uh, mindset. Uh, I'm afraid that we are uh, um, we are more towards uh, the majority of uh, network nodes which doesn't run Flasher. Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, we don't uh, uh, run uh, Slasher. Uh, yeah, this is not good, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's how it is. <laughs> that's all right. All right. I mean, you also mentioned about GUI. Uh, I just wanted to know if this is unique to Grandin, or is it uh, available on almost every client provider? Uh, well, I'm actually not uh, not a uh, graphic user interface, uh, right? Uh, yeah. That's so, right. so I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I'm actually not even sure uh, who else uh, have it. I think Prism at least had it for managing keys or something like that. Uh, uh, so I'm, I really don't follow that much of uh, of what is new in the other client, so I cannot comment uh, on that. However. Um, I can just say that we built the API, this, uh, sorry, the, the um, uh, interface, mainly because at that time when, uh, uh, when, we, um, uh, when, we when, we, when we were in pretty early stage of the client, and I, uh, I often checked um, the performance of the client, and uh, one of the things that uh, I really missed um, in the ecosystem, uh, there was no the tailored rewards uh, uh, interface or something like that. So, so even like um, if you went to, uh, I think recently the the beacon chain, uh, this explorer um, uh, uh, that you can publicly access via the browser, uh, I think they have now a, a more detailed uh, uh, rewards uh, um, visualization. Uh, however, at that time there was almost nothing uh, there, and uh, and I also found that it's pretty it's pretty convenient if you have a lot of uh, validators. It's pretty convenient to spot the problems in your client by checking the rewards uh, in in a pretty you know if if you have a a, a good visualization uh, what rewards uh, you are getting of. Uh, and if you have like thousands of validators, uh, as we have on the uh, on the testnet, uh, then uh, and you have a really good visualization, you can spot uh, uh, the problems of your client. Uh, so so that was the reason why we built it. Uh, but once uh, once we debugged a lot of uh, most of the things, um, actually, I don't remember when I used the uh, user interface. If if I if I need to do something uh, uh, visually. Uh, Currently, actually, this this Beacon Chain uh, Explorer on the uh, uh, on the browser is pretty good uh, for for a lot of things. You can quickly you don't need to run anything, you know, except the browser which everyone is running. So yeah, uh, this uh, this user face user interface, I think maybe at that time was pretty unique thing as as it had uh, um, this rewards uh, visualization but uh, i'm actually not sure that there is a that big demand of of the user interfaces uh, you, you know uh, because the setup is already um, even if you are like a solo staker 
you this is not so easy to set up things uh, you know you need the execution layer you need the consensus layer and you need configuration and uh, i would say at least my understanding is that probably most of the users are pretty uh, experienced in terms of uh, uh, you know on, in, on te uh, in terms of knowledge of uh, linux or whatever and these people doesn't use uh, user interfaces uh, yeah so so i would say uh, i mean graphical user interfaces uh, i think uh, well my current uh, idea is it's probably there is not that big a demand for graphic user interfaces that, that, that's my opinion right i would totally agree to you like the point of man, you mentioned at the end of uh, most of the users here are using linux so probably they are not very much interested in gui and whatever is for normal user or the new users probably it is being provided with the explorers that we have so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah it makes sense all right, my next question is uh, related to performance metrics. Uh, Grand and GitHub suggests that it is the fastest Ethereum consensus layer implementation, uh, which is really good for, uh, especially for new node runners. And your slides have already covered that. Um, in that slide, I saw that CPU usage is showing high during thinking, but it seems to come down after some time. Was it optimized at the time of RTA or why is that? You probably are talking about the step that you see here on, on the slot to uh, 2 million for 100,000. So uh, this was, uh, this is actually a hard fork of uh, Altair. And uh, Altair made, uh, um, you can also see here, uh, well, yeah, like, like this. If, yeah, I think you can spot uh, that there is a, a, a small um, angle here. Uh, basically, and this is exactly uh, two million four uh, four hundred thousand uh, slot. So at this slot, because of the hard fork, um, it both got uh, slower uh, for processing uh, uh, blocks uh, because uh, there were additional um additional computation uh, needed uh, uh, that was introduced in the in the hard work and also this made a, uh, made a bit harder to uh, or, or let's say uh, the parallelization yeah maybe we can say so that the parallelization uh, wasn't uh, so effective after the hard work uh, so so you can see that and the, uh, you can actually see even uh, in other clients uh, that uh, they also dropped uh, uh, for the uh, CPU usage. So, so after the Altair, uh, you basically get slower, um, slower state transition uh, per uh, per block, uh, and also lower uh, usage. Uh, yeah, but this is. Just to note, this is for the syncing uh, CPU usage uh, when the client is syncing. So it's getting a lot of uh, uh, blocks from the network and uh, doing a lot of, uh, really a lot of uh, work. So it, it has uh, like, uh, it has what to do, uh, you know, because after after you synced, the, uh, the CPU usage is much, much lower, uh, you know unless you have a lot of uh, validators so then you need to uh, do a lot of computation for for the um, large amount of uh, validators that makes sense yeah my initial guess was maybe because of altair upgrade because we can see as you mentioned the change for almost every client but the yeah. like step was higher for grandin so it caught attention yeah. here yeah all right, um, my next question is about the client combination. You did mention that while uh, testing GET was uh, the client that was in use. Many of the CL clients use GET because GET is obviously the most popular on the execution side. Uh, on mainnet after the merge, are you by any chance aware of any other combination or is there a way to track uh, different client combinations? Uh, as, as far as I know, uh... I just don't know uh, is it uh, is it very reliable but uh, if you go to client.diversity.org 
uh, I think that's the uh, website. Uh, you can find there is um, diversity for the execution layer clients. Uh, so I actually don't know how reliable it is and what the method they are using uh, for tracking it. But uh, um, as far as I know, there is, if I remember correct, correctly, uh, then the other few other clients like Aragon, Nethermind, and Bezo, I think they have like similar share of like six percent each or something like that so uh, i mean these clients uh, if you are talking about uh, the separate uh, about them separately but for the combinations uh, i'm actually not sure is if there is uh, even i mean this is hard this is pretty hard to reliably detect that uh, you know this, this i actually even don't know the actually even don't know the uh, let's say uh, in even inaccurate way to track the combinations on the network uh, you know like it's it's something uh, not easy because uh, for uh, at least for the consensus layer well you can one thing is to track the client uh, version or agent version and uh, this at least uh, gives you a rough idea and then you can do some other tricks like uh, not like the block production uh, footprints uh, uh, where you see you know the way the attestations are packed uh, in the blocks or, or something like that but for the combinations i'm not sure really, really. I, I cannot even kind of come up with uh, a bit of idea how to track uh, that at least uh, roughly Maybe something for people who are interested in building up tool. This could be one useful tool to keep track of client combination. Maybe, well, uh, maybe. well, on EL side, I know there is a um, client Akula, which is written in Rust. Last I checked, it wasn't ready for production. Hopefully, it will be available soon. Do you think that it will make uh, any difference of using the uh, same? language el and cl client or it is just okay to use any other language uh well that's an interesting uh, uh, question i think for for the you know for the shops or for for the companies that are uh, seriously running uh, uh, software like staking pools or something like that it may be it may make sense uh, to have a clients that are written in single language uh, like both uh, cl and the el uh, language uh, sorry so cl and the el clients um, written in the same language um, especially for those that maybe are optimizing mev or, or something like that you know and or especially for those that uh, that want to uh, you know to not not necessarily follow the protocol and do <laughs> something uh, um, that is profitable for them and and then maybe it makes difference to 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 have a client um, both clients written in a single language i would say but but yeah but i'm i'm not sure that it's so important uh, uh, actually i would say what would be important if you if you want to uh, merge uh, two clients into one piece uh, you know uh, because cu currently maybe it's even maybe there is even not that big need but i i hear a lot of complaints that of of this uh, you know two piece uh, thing uh, that we have uh, like with uh, execution layer and consensus layer because you know whenever we have uh, more pieces than one piece you need to maintain it and uh, and configure and and so on and yeah it would be interesting to see this is i think this is main maybe against the idea of you know having a separate uh, pieces which does a um, um, dedicated job uh, and so on but uh, uh, after some network upgrades if uh, uh, it could be that there would be like significant um, benefit having one piece uh, client and and then a uh, single language uh, matters uh, you know so so i would say so but uh, coming back to to a cooler question i think one of the key problems is that the uh, execution layer clients Actually, the, the CL clients are also pretty complex, but the execution layer uh, execution layer clients are probably even more complex, uh, you know. And this is something uh, 
something that cannot, uh, you know, you cannot ship that uh, fast. Uh, you need a team that is working for a few years uh, and so on. And uh, well, I think we, the cooler client still needs uh, some time to, uh, you know, to reach uh, uh, like better version or, or, or even if you talk about, uh, you know, production stability, I think it's, it's a far away. Uh, so that's, um, that's probably more important than the language uh, it's written. And so, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, Akula is getting ready. I, as far as I am aware, they are participating in different uh, test nets um, mm -hmm. on, on their own level. So hopefully that would be ready soon. Um, talking about test nets, uh, uh, we have seen Altair upgrade in 2021. Are you planning, like I'm talking from Grandin's point of view, for future network upgrade? Are you planning to participate in DevNet for Shanghai or Capella? I don't know if there is a particular name for the upgrade because uh, it is not uh, decided yet. But I know Shandong is a testnet which is live with uh, five EIPs for Shanghai. 4844 and withdrawal EIP is still not there. But if they are considered, what are the chances that Grandin will participate in that? Yeah, so historically, we don't. Uh... Um, usually don't participate in a very early uh, test nets. Uh, so there are a few reasons. I think the the, the one reason is um, uh, is that it's not that easy to build things fast in Rust. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it, it's pretty. Let's say you know it, it, it's it's not a, like a scripting language where you can just uh, quickly uh, hack things uh, uh, together. Uh, and uh, especially with the code base that we have, the, the, that is highly optimized, uh, and it's not very easy to uh, to to move uh, things drastically uh, there. Uh, so this is one reason. Another thing, of course, yeah, if we had uh, like more funding for for this, uh, you know, for for building uh, new features um, uh, fast and experimenting with that, because uh, joining the test not early usually means that, uh, well, you, you will need to rework a lot of things uh, uh, until it is a uh, final version, uh, you know? And th that's the reason why the test nets, uh, especially early test nets uh, are done. So we usually join uh, them uh, later. And uh, yeah, I think um, we're mostly interested in, in those final test nets. <laughs> we always try to participate like, uh, you know, some like a Gorlin network or, or something like that. Uh, and uh, based on the circumstances, if we have time and uh, if, uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, the client is ready for the earlier participation, uh, we participate, uh, but uh, as I said, um, uh, usually we are, uh, because of the constraints that we have, we usually don't uh, join uh, very early. That makes a lot of sense. Anyway, DevNets mm -hmm. are for client development team to make sure the specs for that particular upgrade are fine. And if that, those are being tested by a couple of clients, that would be good for most of the clients. So participating in public testnet isn't that bad idea. So it's good that we are at least covered before the mainnet upgrade. Yeah, yeah. One of the question related to client readiness before the upgrade. I'm not sure if the client uh, release version for Grandine is being shared by EF blog post that is generally being published before the upgrade, network upgrade. If not, then I'll be curious to know at the time of upgrade, how does the Grandine client development team communicate with users to upgrade their node, like some internal channels or... Um, yeah, public forum. Yeah, yeah. So you know, as as the client is not uh, open source, that it's um, it's obvious that uh, these like main sources uh, like Ethereum Foundation blog posts and something like that, they do not cover uh, closed source uh, things. You know, apart from. I don't know, maybe MAV, like flashbots and map boost related stuff was actually welcomed in some sense until they got really open sourced. But uh, but basically our client is not in the list of, of the things that um, usually shared, uh, you know, during the 
uh, official uh, sources. And uh, because we don't have a large uh, market share and uh, people just know that um, uh, they, they can just pull uh, the latest Docker and, uh, and things are fixed uh, there. And uh, we actually even don't uh, release the binaries that often. And uh, well, actually released finally the, uh, the new version of uh, 0.20. Which um, uh, which has uh, all the uh, latest features, but uh, before people just uh, pull the Docker uh, images uh, as we are um, often uh, pushing the latest version to Docker Hub. So yeah, this is I would say we are kind of in in a stealth mode uh, now, uh, where uh, pe the people that uh, use our client they just know where to get it. <laughs> so. So yeah, this this is probably not uh, very common <laughs> among other open source clients, but uh, that's how it is uh, uh, now. Uh, so yeah. Talking about this open source and closed source, so have you observed any resistance in acceptance of granting by the community because this is not open source? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, well, this there is obvious uh, thing um, uh, that uh, majority of uh, the users um, uh, are kind of resistant, and I think that's a, that's a good thing. Um, so yeah, there is uh, for sure uh, like resistance uh, to to this. Uh, however. Uh, during all the time, I have never heard um, any uh, constructive reason why one cannot uh, use uh, in the public permissionless uh, network, why one can't use uh, minority uh, closed source uh, beacon node. Uh, so, I mean, there is no just uh, reason, uh, really. I mean, apart, of, uh, apart from ideological things um, uh, that, well, for sure, everything uh, uh, should be open source. And that's, uh, that's uh, the great idea. And we also agree with that. And we are moving uh, toward this. Uh, however, uh, as long, as I said, as long as the client is a minority client and you protect your keys uh, outside of uh, the binary, uh, I don't see, uh, at least I, I didn't hear any constructive reason to not uh, use uh, uh, the beacon or the, because you, you can always uh, um, check the performance of your uh, node and if it's uh, if it if it behaves uh, well, uh, well you you get a good rewards uh, and uh, well you you don't pass the key to the to this closed source uh, component and yeah. I, I would like to hear a reason. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not uh, advocating that people need to to, to turn to closed source uh, clients. Uh, this is really not something I want to say, but I would like to hear a constructive reason uh, to uh, that uh, uh, that permits uh, uh, people to use minority uh, closed source beacon uh, node. Uh, so yeah, that's. Uh, mm, that would be interesting if somebody comes up uh, with with this. I agree. I mean, as long as users are getting support from client provider, it should not be a challenge. Yeah, and especially you know if 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 the client is a minority client, actually, if if this minority client is behaving um, incorrectly, uh, and if it makes trouble to the network then actually it's a problem of the network, uh, really. If some minority client uh, can be so, uh, you know, so powerful to disturb the uh, network, uh, uh, then, well, this is something wrong with uh, either the protocol, either the implementation of the uh, protocol. Right. All right, uh, it's time to wrap up. Uh, anything else that you would like to share with the community? Any advice for an aspiring Ethereum node runner or validator? Yeah, so my main uh, message would be try to use uh, minority clients uh, more, especially if you are on uh, using some majority client like uh, uh, Prism or Lighthouse. There are some available clients uh, that are open source and they, they are minority clients who use them. 
or uh, if you want uh, to go even further, uh, try uh, Grandina Beacon node with the validator that you are prefer, uh, like uh, some other uh, client validator, which is open source or, or even um, a different service like a voucher. Uh, and yeah, try to uh, try to diversify as much as possible and try to give a network, uh, uh, try to strength, uh, uh, to give more strength, strength to the network uh, by uh, using a, a minority client. So hopefully uh, yeah, this is, um, uh, th this will be both uh, good for, for the network and uh, even for yourself. Uh, so yeah, and uh, otherwise, uh, uh, yeah, uh, try to, uh, at some point, uh, try to uh, to use Grandin at least in some uh, way, even if you are not uh, uh, staking uh, or so. And if you have any feedback and uh, um, and uh, or preferences or or some questions or something like that, uh, join us on uh, uh, Discord. So that's um, uh, th that's uh, th that will be good uh, for us uh, to hear from you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. We appreciate your sharing insight on grandine client development work and the roadmap. Thanks a lot for your time. So Grandin offers a variety of features with Ethereum CL specs opening door for new users to join Ethereum node running and be a validator to earn rewards. In my mind, having an open source client may have helped adoption, but nevertheless, I hope to see this client on the client diversity chart making a difference. And uh, on this note, thanks to everyone watching or listening to this special episode on Know Your Client series. Should you have any question, leave a comment, reach us on eCathodist Discord. Check out description for links to useful resources and guest Twitter to follow. Stay tuned for upcoming talks on EIPs and network upgrade. Keep sharing your love with Ethereum catalysts. Cheers.